Welcome to another video. This is GCSE Mathematics Practice Set 8 for the higher tier. Paper 1 non calculator. This is for the Edexcel exam board. I'll be going through the whole paper, paper and mark scheme in the description if you want those. Let's get straight into it. Question 1, part A says write 8 times 10 to the power of 4 as an ordinary number. What does this mean? Well, it's 8 times 10,000, basically. 10 to the power of 4 is 10,000. 8 times 10,000, that's going to be. 80,000 and you will notice something as well in terms of the power and the number of zeros on that number That's right. The power is equivalent to the number of zeros uh, If you're converting from standard form to an ordinary number, so That's another way to figure that out part B says work out 3.5 times 10 to the power 5 divided by 7 times 10 to the power 8 to give your answer in standard form. So this becomes easier if you write it slightly differently. So another way of writing this is uh, 3.5 times 10 to the power 5 divided by 7 times 10 to the power 8. And all I've done is write that as a fraction instead of a division. And another way of writing this now is to say this is 3.5 over 7 multiplied by 10 to the power 5 over 10 to the power 8. So by writing in this way, you can see that this expression is equivalent to if we divide those numbers out the front and multiply it by the second term in those brackets. So what this basically does is it allows us to subtract these powers and that just allows you to simplify it a bit easier. So firstly, let's look at this 3.5 over 7. You hopefully know that 3.5 is half of 7. So we can write this as a half. Actually, an easier way of writing that is 0.5 if we're talking about standard form. And then we'll have 10 to the power 5 over 10 to the power 8. Because we have the same base number, we can subtract the indices. So 5 take 8 is 10 to the negative 3. And then with standard form, you want that first number to be between 1 and 10. It's less than 1. So what do we need to do? We need to multiply that by 10. So we'll have 5 times 10 to the power of something. Now, if I multiply that by 10, you also need to divide the whole expression by 10. If I divide the whole expression by 10, uh, what we're doing here is 10 to the negative 3 over 10, or 10 to the power 1. So then if I was to simplify that, we'd do negative 3 take 1, which is 10 to the power of negative 4. Uh, a shortcut, instead of thinking about it this way, is to say, well, I want to move that decimal place over to the right. And if I move that to the right, I also need to take 1 away from the power of 10. Anyways, final answer there, 5 times 10 to the negative 4. And let's go into question 2 now. Question 2 says... Uh, simplify y to the power 5 times y to the power 9. For this, you need to know your index laws. And one of the index laws says if you have the same base numbers, you can uh, add the powers. So this is going to simplify to uh, y to the power of 5 plus 9, which is 14. Part B says simplify 2m cubed to the power of 4. Uh, another index law says if you have all of this uh, to the power of 4, you multiply the powers. So uh, the power of 2 here, you need to pretend there's a little 1 uh, in that power. So we'll have uh, 2 to the power 1 times 4, which is 2 to the power of 4. And then m to the power of 3. 3 times 4 is 12, so we'd have m to the power of 12. And then to simplify further, we need to find what 2 to the power of 4 is. Uh, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. That's 16. So uh, in simplest form, this would be 16m to the power of 12. Part C says solve 5 times x plus 3 equals 3x take 4. Show clear algebraic working. All right, so we need to solve this algebraic uh, equation. Firstly, I would expand out those brackets. So we get 5x plus 15 equals 3x take 4. And then what you want is all of the x's or unknowns on the left-hand side and all of the constants on the right-hand side. So I will subtract that 3x from the left. We'll have 5x take 3x. And then negative 4 on the right take 15 because it's a positive 15 over here. If I want to bring that over to the other side, it needs to become a negative. I need to subtract it. So now on the left here, I have 5x take 3x, which is 2x. On the right, I have negative 4 take 15, which is negative 19. And then 
divide by 2, do the opposite to get rid of that 2 times x. So divide by 2 and I get uh, negative 19 divided by 2. And that would probably be fine for a final answer. You could also simplify that to uh, 19 divided by 2 is negative 9.5. So my final answer there is negative 9.5 for 3 marks. And that was question 2 for a total of 6 marks. On to question 3. Question 3 says here is a Venn diagram. We have the universal set and then sets A, B, and C. And part 1 says write down the numbers that are in set A. Well, that's all of the numbers in this circle A. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 12. Now, one way to do this without missing anything is just to uh, cross them out and write them down straight after you cross them out, just in case you miss something somehow. You know, you don't want to make those small errors. So cross them out as you go. And that way you make sure you get all of them. So six numbers in set A, one, two, three, four, six, and 12. Part two says write down the numbers that are in set B union C. So I have a video on Venn diagrams and what these symbols mean. Uh, so one way to think of this union symbol, this is stated as union, uh, and this can be also referred to as or. So you can say, we're looking for the numbers in set B or in set C. Now this is in contrast to the intersect symbol, which means and. So that would be numbers that are in set B and set C. That's in the middle, that part there. So when you're looking for the union set, you're looking for the numbers in B or C, which is in here in set B or set C. So it's everything in this area that I've just highlighted. What I should have done there is actually rub out these uh, crossing outs. Okay, and then what I want to do again now is to cro uh, cross them out as I write them down. So one, uh, three, five, seven, nine, and you don't have to do them in order, but you know, Makes a bit more sense, doesn't it, if you do them in order? Okay, so there we have seven numbers in that set B union C, um, and one, three, five, seven, nine, ten, eleven is what we're looking for there. So that was one mark for each of those, and a total of two marks for question three. Question four A says make A the subject of the formula M equals A C take B D. Okay, so what we want to do with this is to make uh, A the subject. In other words, A is going to be all by itself on the left-hand side of this equation. And you need to know how to rearrange equations to uh, answer these types of questions. So the first thing we want to do is to, to start isolating A is to get rid of this negative BD. So probably my first line here would be AC equals M plus BD. So hopefully you can see I've taken this negative BD, taken it over to the other side, and you'll notice M is now on the right-hand side. I've also flipped that equation around so that AC is on the left and M is on the right. It's perfectly fine to do that. It's like saying, uh, you know, 1 plus 2 equals uh, 3, and therefore 3 equals 1 plus 2. All you do is flip it around so that the thing on the left hand side is the thing on the right hand side. Okay, so uh, all I've done there is added the BD and flipped it around and then to get A by itself divide by C, right? Because this is A multiplied by C, so then divide by C. So this is M plus BD all divided by C. And when it says make A the subject of the formula, you need to isolate A, that's what we've done. We now have A by itself, and that equals M plus BD all over C. And that would be your final answer for two marks. Part B says solve the inequality, 5X take four is less than 39. Very similar to solving equations. First thing you want to do here is to add that four to the right hand side. So 39 plus four, that would be 43, and then divide by five. So x would be less than 43 on 5. 
The only thing you have to be careful with with inequalities or solving inequalities is if you divide or multiply by a negative number. So uh, because we don't have any negatives there, uh, that was pretty straightforward. Final answer there, x less than 43 over 5. Part C says factorize fully 18e squared times f cubed, subtract 12e cubed times f. I have a video going into factorizing in detail, uh, and I talk about looking for the things that are common between both terms, the highest common factor between both terms. Now for this, you want to look at the numbers first, so 18 and 12. What is the highest common factor of 18 and 12? Well, I know 6 goes into 18 and 12. Is there anything higher that goes into both? No, there's not. So 6 is going to be the highest common factor between those two. So I would write that number down, 6, and then look at the letters. We've got e squared here and an e cubed in the second term. That means e squared is common to both. And also have an f in the second term and an f cubed in the first term. Well, that means only one f will be part of this common factor. And then draw your brackets in and look what's left. So 6 times what equals 18? 6 times 3 equals 18. We've taken an e squared out, so there's not going to be an e squared in that first term. And we have uh, an f squared left. So you can think of that as taking 1 away from that exponent. So we'd have an f squared. And then for my second term, 6 times 2 is 12, and we have an e squared out the front, so we still have 1 e left in that second term, and we've taken the f out, so that f will not be in the brackets here. So that is your final answer for question 4, part c, and also I just want to point out, if you are struggling with factorizing, here's one strategy you can use. You can write out each term uh, in its extended form. So write out the factors as you would uh, without the powers. So e squared is e times e, f cubed is f times f times f. And you could do that for the second term. And then you can circle the, the letters and the numbers that are common to both. And that's one way to make factorize a little bit easier. But anyway, that was question four for a total of six marks. Question five, part A says factorize x squared plus 2x take 24. So for this, we're looking to factorize a quadratic into two brackets, and you are looking for factors of 24 that make two. Factors of 24 that make two. So factors of 24, I know six and four, multiply those, they make 24, and I know the difference between those two numbers is two. So I'm going to go with six and four here. Now we don't have a coefficient of x squared, so I know the first terms in those brackets are going to be x and x. And what I would do is just write that 6 and 4 in and then think about what signs we want. So we have a negative 24. We know one of those is going to be negative And we have a positive 2. So how do we make positive 2? Well, we would have a positive 6 and a negative 4 because 6 take 4 is positive 2. So my final answer there would be x6 and x take 4. There are plenty of ways of factorizing quadratics. I have a video on factorizing quadratics with a number of different methods. So uh, depending on which you prefer, check that video out if you're still confused with factorizing quadratics. But let's go into part B. It says, hence solve x squared plus 2x take 24 equals 0. So what this is saying is then x plus 6 x take 4 equals 0. What does this mean? Well, either x plus 6 equals 0 or x take 4 equals 0. Uh, and what we do from here is we say, well, therefore, x must equal negative 6, right? Rearranging this, or x equals positive 4, adding that 4 to the other side. So you actually get two answers for a quadratic. So therefore, we can just write down a negative 6 and 4 for our answers to part b. That was question five for three marks. Question six gives us a diagram and it says L, M and N are points on a circle center O. Q, M, T is a tangent to the circle at M. So this line here is a tangent. A part one says find the size of angle N, O, M. That's in here. So for this question, you need to know your circle theorems. I have a video on all of the circle theorems you need to know for GCSEs. This one is going to involve the angle at the center theorem. The angle at the center is 
uh, double the angle at the circumference. So if you have two angles uh, joined to the circle at the same point, one angle at the circumference, one at the center, this angle is going to be double the angle at the circumference. So twice 27 is 54 degrees. And then it says, give a reason for your answer. And that theorem is called the angle at the center theorem. And we can also describe it. So it says the angle at the center, the angle at the center is twice the angle at the circumference. Part B, part one says find the size of angle NMQ. NMQ is in, uh, in here, actually. This is another circle theorem. This is the alternate segment theorem. This is probably one of the most difficult circle theorems. But basically it says if you have a tangent and then a triangle joined to that tangent, and in this case the triangle is joined to the tangent at M here, the angle between the triangle and the tangent will be the same as this opposite angle in the triangle uh, or the angle in the alternate segment. So we actually know that angle QMN is equal to 27 uh, due to that alternate segment theorem. And I also have the proof of that in that video I talked about before. So we can say angle, angle NMQ is 27 degrees and that theorem is called the alternate segment theorem. Okay, so that's question six for a total of four marks. Question seven says the cumulative frequency graph shows information about the length in minutes of each of 80 films. Here we have the cumulative frequency and then the length on the x-axis. Part A says use the graph to find an estimate for the interquartile range. So let's look at the upper quartile. That will be three quarters of 80, that's 60. And the lower quartile is one quarter of 80, that's 20 and we need to go across to the graph and then down to the times to actually find the value of the upper and lower quartiles. So let's do that first. Okay, so these values down here in the minutes are actually going to be our lower and upper quartile. Now we need to look at this scale. I believe this is one for every tick. So going from 100, this would be between 100 to 103. You could probably get away with saying it's either of those, but we could also say it's 102.5 minutes. This one is pretty clearly on 123 minutes. So now that you have the upper and lower quartiles, the interquartile range is the difference between those. So 123 take 102.5, the difference there is 20.5 minutes. Okay, so that's how you're going about finding the interquartile range. Part B says, Claire says more than 35% of these films are over 120 minutes long. Is Claire correct? Give a reason for your answer. So over 120 minutes long, let's firstly go up to the graph and find the uh, cumulative frequency at 120 minutes. So if we go up, oops, I haven't given myself enough room there. 120 and then go across, it's in between, again, two different values. So the scale on this axis is also one for every tick there. So this is going to be between 55 and 56. I'm going to round it down to 55 because if we take a larger number there, then we can uh, hopefully prove that it's still less than, still less than 35%. So then we look at the cumulative frequency between the max and uh, 120 minutes. So this is the number of films greater than 120 minutes long. So 80 take 55, that's 25. So what we're saying is there's 25 films in this area here, or this uh, interval here, 25 films greater than 120 minutes long. So as a percentage, what is that? Uh, well, 25 out of 80, that's what we're going to be thinking about. 25 out of 80. Kind of difficult without a calculator. I have to say, I'm surprised at this question, to be honest, in a non-calculated question. But let's go ahead and try to convert this to a percentage. I would probably try to write this over 100. So the goal here is to write it over 100, a fraction out of 100 and then therefore state it as a percentage. To do that, you could firstly divide by two and then you've got 40 
So 25 divided by 2 is 12.5. And then 40 times 2.5 is going to be 100. So actually, let's just write down. I've divided by 2, and then I'm going to multiply by 2.5 to get uh, 100. 12.5 times 2.5. So it would be 25 plus half of 12.5, uh, half of 12.5 is 6.25. So then we would get uh, 25 plus 6.25 is 31.25. Okay, so that's one way to convert that fraction into a percentage because now we can say that's 31.25%. Now you recall that uh, we actually rounded this number down so even if we uh, took uh, the interval to be larger than it actually is, we still get a percentage less than 35%. So how to go about proving this statement is incorrect? Well, firstly, let's state that it is incorrect. So no, uh, Claire is incorrect. Remember when they ask you questions like this, is Claire correct or is Sam incorrect? Always state this because that's going to get you a guaranteed mark. State whether they're correct or incorrect. Then we want to explain why. Oh, another thing we could do is actually find 35% of 80. So how do we go about doing that? Uh, well, you could do you could do uh, 35 times 8. So this would be um, 5 times 8 is 40. 3 times 8 is 24. Plus 4 is 28. Um, so then we'd have to divide by 10. So this would actually be 28. So 35% of 80 is 28. That's another way you could go about proving it. Uh, but I will go with this statement. I would say about, so about 25 films are over 120 minutes and 25 out of 80 is only 31.25%, which is less than 35%. Anyways, that was question seven for a total of five marks. Question eight says, Felix has 10 cards. There are five red cards, four blue cards, and one green card. Felix takes at random one of the cards. He does not replace the card. Felix then takes at random a second card. Complete the probability tree diagram. Important to note that he is not replacing the card. So what's going to happen with this probability? Well, if he takes a red card, there's going to be one less red card uh, in the pack. So we would have four red cards now to choose from and then a total of nine cards now because he's taken one out. So that's if he picked a red in the second pick. For the blue cards, he has not removed a blue card yet. If we're going along this branch here, if he picked a red card first, so he would still have four blue cards, but his total again is still down to nine. So the total for the second pick here, they're all going to be nines, uh, but we just need to think about how many uh, red, blue, and green cards will be in that second pick. For the green, again, because we picked a red card first, we still have that one green card left and a total of nine cards. Okay, going down to if we picked a blue card first, well, if we want to pick a red card second, we would still have five red cards. Again, that total is nine. If we want to pick a blue card second, we would now have three blue cards left out of a total of nine. And you can simplify these fractions if you like, uh, but it tends to actually just be simpler if you just leave them as is. And I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a second. Uh, but if we picked a blue card first, green card second, we still have that one green card out of nine. And then if we picked a green card first, second pick red, we'd have five out of nine. Blue, we'd still have those four blue cards out of nine. And then because we picked that green card, there's only one green card in the pack. We would now have a zero uh, probability of zero percent probability of getting a green card second. So that's going to be a zero there. So that's what your probability tree diagram should look like after being filled out. Part B says work out the probability that Felix takes at least one blue card and no green card. Okay, so we're looking for the probability of what? Now we want to restate this a little bit because the way they state it doesn't really help with working out the probability. So they say at least one blue card and no green card. That means in none of the picks we get a green card. Well, so what branches are we looking at here? Uh, we want at least one blue card. 
So we could have a red card first and a blue card second. We could have a blue card first and then a red card. Or we could have a blue and then another blue. It doesn't say we can't have two blue cards. It just says at least one. So, so far we have three branches. It also says no green cards. So that's going to rule out this entire branch down the bottom here because that's a green card first. And these other two branches down here, they include green cards. This one up here we can't include because there's no blue card in that red and red branch. So there are all the branches we're going to be looking at. Now, if you have a tree diagram like this, once you highlight or circle the branches you're looking for, all you need to do is firstly multiply the probabilities along the branches. So this one here, this probability, a red and then a blue is going to be five over 10 multiplied by four over nine. So that's how probability tree diagrams work. This one down here, a blue and then a red, that's going to be four over 10 multiplied by five over nine. And then for blue and then a blue, we'd have four over 10 multiplied by three over nine. And this is kind of the reason why I say don't really bother simplifying these fractions, because what we want to do now is to add all of these probabilities together. And if we leave those numbers as is, the 10 and the nine, we end up with the same denominator. If we simplified this fraction, we'd have a different denominator here, and we'd probably end up having to uh, multiply it by something again anyways. So I would suggest leaving these probabilities as is rather than simplifying uh, so you get those denominators to be the same when you're doing the second part of the question. So anyways, back to what we're trying to do. When you are working out the probability of branches, you multiply all those probabilities together, I'm not going to go into that reasoning. I think that's important to understand. And if you don't understand why I'm multiplying these branches and adding the results together, you really need to do some work on your probability and understanding how to work out probabilities. But that's for a separate video. In this one, I'm just describing how we're working this out. We've got these probabilities for each branch. We add those together and that will give us our total probability for this problem. So. Down below, we're going to do, we're going to write all of these down. So following from this statement, what we're actually looking for is blue, red, or red, blue, or blue, blue. They were all the possibilities we were looking for. And this turned out to be uh, four times 10, as we said, multiplied by five over nine, plus five over 10 times four over nine, plus four over 10 times three over nine. Okay, now we're going to simplify this. Uh, the first one here is going to be 20 over 90 plus 20 over 90 plus 12 over 90. And if we add those numerators because we the denominators are all the same, so we can just add the numerators. 40 plus 12 is 52 over 90. And we could go ahead and simplify that as well if we wanted to, but it doesn't say to simplify, so you can leave that as is 52 over 90 is your final answer there for part B. So that was question eight for a total of five marks. Question nine says, in the diagram below, P and Q are points on a circle with center O. QT is a tangent to the circle angle OPQ equals 18 degrees, as indicated. Work out the size of angle PQT. Give a reason for each stage of your working. Okay, that's important to note. You need to give a reason for everything you're doing in this. So the first thing I would note is that, uh, well, we have a tangent here, therefore angle OQT in here is 90 degrees. So the angle between a radius and a tangent is always 90 degrees. So firstly, OQT equals 90 degrees. And all you need to state there is uh, tangent radius. That's all they look for for that mark. Uh, those two words, because it shows you understand where that 90 degrees comes from. Next, uh, we also see that O is the center. They tell us that's the center. Therefore, OP and OQ are both radii of this circle. Therefore, they're both equal length. Therefore, triangle QOP is isosceles, and we could state that. I'm not sure if you absolutely have to state that. I'll have a look at the mark scheme towards the end, but we could say this is um, is isosceles and therefore 
base angles in our isosceles triangle are equal, so angle OQP is going to be 18 degrees in there. So angle OQP or PQO equals 18 degrees. And we can say base angles, base angles in an isosceles triangle. And therefore we have this angle of 90 degrees. We have this one in here of 18. Therefore PQT is going to be 90 take 18. So angle PQT equals 90 take 18 and that is 72 degrees. So final answer there, 72 for question nine. Question 10 says function f is such that f of x equals 3x take five over four. Part a says find f of negative seven. What this is saying is we need to substitute negative seven into this function. So wherever an x is, we need to put in negative seven. So this would be three multiplied by negative seven, take five over four. So this is negative 21, take five over four. Negative 21 take five is negative 26 over four. And if you like, you can simplify this, but it doesn't say to simplify, so you don't have to, but you can also write this as negative 13 on two. That will be your final answer there. Part B says express the inverse function f in the form f inverse x equals. So there is a standard approach to this. The first thing is to let f of x equal y and then you state this as y equal to 3x take 5 over 4. And this is in order to rearrange this equation in terms of x. So then what you want to do is to isolate x on the left hand side. So firstly multiply by 4 and flip it around so we would have 3x take 5 equal to 4y and then add that 5 over to the other side. We'd have 3x equal to 4y plus 5 and then x equal to 4y plus 5 on 3 and then what you do is you say that x is now the inverse function because we've inverted this function. Uh, we've made the input now the output so x is now our inverse function and y is our input. So this is now 4x plus 5 on 3. So this is what you do to get the inverse function. You swap those variables x and y for f inverse and y becomes x. Uh, so then our inverse function is 4x plus 5 over 3. And I have a video on composite and inverse functions if you want to go into that in more detail. But on to part c. Part c says the function g is such that g of x equals the square root of 19 take x. Find f g of 3. So firstly we want to find g of 3. That means to input 3 into this function here. So g of 3 would be the square root of 19 take 3. With that x I've substituted in 3. 19 take 3 is 16, the square root of 16 is 4. So then we go back to f of x, this function we originally had, and we need to input uh, 4, that's our g of 3. So input 4 into f of x, we would have 3 times 4 take 5 over 4. So 3 times 4 take 5 over 4. This would be uh, 12 take 5 over 4. 12 take 5 is 7 over 4. That's as simple as you're going to get there. So final answer is 7 over 4 for part C. And that was question 10 for a total of 5 marks. Question 11 says 8 over 2 to the power 7 equals 2 to the n. And part A says find the value of n. So for this you want to write the left hand side uh, as a power of 2. So the first thing I would do here is to say that 8 over 2 to the power 7 equals 2 to the power 3 over 2 to the power 7. That's another way of writing 8. And then you know your index laws and you know that uh, if we have the same base numbers we can subtract the powers. So 3 take 7 is negative 4. So this can be written as 2 to the power of negative 4. Therefore if we're saying that 8 over 2 to the power 7 equals 2 to the n, then that must mean that n equals negative 4. Okay, so that was part A. Part B gives us 13 to the power of negative 6 to the power of 4 multiplied by 13 to the power of 5 equals 13 to the power of k. Find the value of k. 
similar to the first part except we're multiplying the powers now so for this first uh, term here we would have 13 to the power of negative 24 6 times 4 multiplied by 13 to the power of 5 when you are multiplying numbers with the same base you can add the exponent so negative 24 plus 5 this is going to be 13 to the power of negative 19 so therefore looking at these powers k is going to equal negative 19 for part b that was question 11 for four marks question 12 says the diagram shows two straight lines drawn on a grid here we have the straight line 3y equals 2x plus 6 and this is 4x plus 3y equals 24 and part a says write down the solutions of the simultaneous equations uh, 3y plus 2x plus 6 so 3y equals 2x plus 6 which is this one here and then 4x plus 3y equals 24 which is this one well when you have simultaneous equations and they're both straight line equations in other words there are no powers of the uh, variables then you're going to have one solution for x and one solution for y and the solution is where those lines intersect so the solutions to these simultaneous equations is this intersection here which is 3 4 so the solution for x is 3 and the solution for y is 4 so as long as you understand that about simultaneous equations you should be fine for that one mark there part b says show by shading on the grid the regions defined by all five of the inequalities x greater than or equal to 0 y greater than or equal to 0 x plus y greater than or equal to 4 3y less than or equal to 2x plus 6 and 4x plus 3y less than or equals to 24 so first thing to note is uh, we have these lines here and we've replaced the equal sign with the inequality and I'll talk about what that means in a minute but firstly I want to focus on these two x greater than or equal to 0 well if we look at the grid up here if x is greater than 0 it's to the right of the y-axis okay so this is where the x values are positive now for these shading the region inequality questions what you can do is to uh, shade just do a little light shading along the boundary of that inequality so don't shade the whole thing in but that just shows you where you're looking at the regions you're looking at so just do a little shading or just do an arrow either way uh, but it, just do some indication of of your new region that you're looking at and I would suggest doing that in pencil so you can rub uh, what you've done out in a minute then we're also looking at y greater than or equal to zero so combining those two we're actually looking at this uh, region in here this quarter of this grid right so uh, I can actually rub out this bit down here and that's going to be the region where x is greater than 0 and y is greater than 0 also we're looking at x plus y greater than or equal to 4 and we're going to have to graph this line this is a straight line and you could if you want write that as a straight line equation this would be negative x plus 4 what that tells you is the y-intercept is 4 so if we go up to the graph we'd have a y-intercept at 4 and a negative 1 as the gradient so go across one down one for the gradient and you get the next point and the next one and the next one so we would have a straight line in here that's all I'm going to draw because uh, I know that I'm only looking at this part of the grid and it also says x plus y is greater than 4 or in other words you could also write that as y greater than or equal to 4 if you make y the subject of that inequality then you need to look above that line like that so y gets more positive in the upwards direction so therefore you have y greater than a particular equation then you're looking above that line so actually we can also rub out all of these bits down here so now we're just looking at this region in here and let's keep going now it also says 3y less than or equal to 2x plus 6 well if we rearrange this we would be looking at less than uh, this line here this one here we've already been given that straight line 
So we're looking at uh, Y less than that line. So we're looking below this line here. So hopefully you see now that uh, the usefulness of doing that little bit of shading because it really makes clear the areas you can start to ignore as well. So I can rub out all of this now because uh, I need to be below this line here. And then we've got one more area to consider. Uh, we have 4x plus 3y less than 24. Well, that's going to also be less than this straight line here. So below this line, downwards on the y axis or in the y direction. So what that turns out to be is, we can also ignore this bit over here, what that turns out to be is this area in here and it says label the region R. So let's put a big R in there and do a bit of shading and uh, that should be pretty clear to the markers that you found the correct area for that question. Question 13 says the diagram shows parallelogram ABCD, vector AB equals 2, 7, vector AC equals 10, 11, the point B has coordinates 5, 8, so let's go ahead and label that first, 5, 8, work out the coordinates of the point C. So these are column vectors, that's saying that to get from A to B we need to go across 2 and up 7 or up seven across two either way. So basically from A to B, this would be seven and across two. So then we can work out point A fairly easily using these coordinates. So basically take two from the X coordinate, take seven from the Y coordinate, then A would equal three, one. So now we have point A, we can get to C by adding 10 and 11 to the X and Y coordinates. So 3 plus 10 is 13, and 1 plus 11 is 12. So for that question, you just need to understand how column vectors work, and you should be fine for those three marks there. Part B says the point E has coordinates 63, 211. Use a vector method to prove that ABE is a straight line. Firstly, let's say, uh, let's state the vector AB again. This was uh, 2, 7 as stated up here. And we're looking for the vector BE, they've given us E. So let's also write down the point B, this was five, eight. So to work out the vector BE, we can uh, essentially subtract the, uh, the coordinates. So 63 take five, 63 take five, and 211 take eight. That's going to find how far across and how far up we need to go to get from B to E. So that's going to be 58 and then 203. And now to state that AB is a straight line, this vector BE needs to be a multiple of AB. So you should know that from working with vectors, in order for vectors to be in a straight line, uh, this, let's say if this was vector A here uh, and vector B, what you want is for B to equal some multiple of A, some scalar multiple of A. So for example, if B was three times A, we would have B equal to three A. And what that tells you is that B is going in the same direction as A, parallel to A, but because they share a point, they must be on a straight line. So that's what we're looking for for this. We want BE to be some multiple of AB. Now the question is, is there a factor of 58 and 203 that will make two and seven or we'll be left with two and seven. So the first thing to work out is 58 divided by two. Um, well, two times 29 would be 58. So we could say this is uh, 29 times two. And then hopefully 29 times seven is 203. So what I would probably do is just do that over to the side just to make sure you're not making any silly mistakes. So nine times seven is 63, carry the six, two times seven is 14 plus six is 20. So yes, 29 times seven is 203. So we could also state that BE equals 29 times 
2, 7, the column vector 2, 7. Therefore, BE equals uh, 29 times AB. So we have this case where one vector is a multiple of another vector, just like we stated over here. So just to finish that off, as B lies on both vectors and B equals KAB, AB is a straight line. So possibly a three mark question, but okay, two marks is fine. And that was question 13 for a total of five marks. Question 14 says R is proportional to T squared. The graph shows the relationship between R and T for T between zero and four. Okay, so here we have R on the y-axis going up to 40 and T on the x-axis going up to four. Part A says find a formula for R in terms of T. Okay, first thing to state here is if they tell you R is proportional to T squared, write that down. So the way you write that down is using this symbol. That means proportional to. So R is proportional to T squared. And then to turn that into an equation, uh, to turn proportionality into an equation, you need to introduce a constant. So R is going to equal KT squared. And then to solve for that constant, in order to uh, have a formula, you need to use a point from this graph. So luckily they give you a fairly nice point here, uh, right on the intersection between two and 10. So then we can say uh, when r equals 10 and t equals 2, we would say then that 10 equals k multiplied by 2 squared. So substituting that point into our equation, we're going to be able to solve for k. So then divide by 2 squared, so k is going to equal 10 over 4 or 5 on 2. So going back to our equation, substitute that back in we would have our formula as r equal to 5 on 2 t squared. Okay, so that is how you're doing part A there. Part B says, given also that r equals 8 on 5x, show that t is inversely proportional to the square root of x for t greater than 0. All right, so what I'd start off with here is that r equals 8 over 5x. So firstly, substitute that into your formula here. So for r, substitute in 8 over 5x and this equals 5 on 2 t squared and then you want to rearrange so that t is the subject of this equation because they're asking show that t is inversely proportional to the square root of x so make t the subject so what you could do here is multiply by 2 on the left hand side we would have 16 and then divide by 5. So if you divide by 5 here, you can multiply this denominator by 5. This would be 25x equal to t squared, and then take the square root of both sides. And I might flip this around as well, so I have t on the left-hand side. So if I square root both sides, t squared, the square root of that is just t. The square root of 16 is 4. The square root of 25 is 5 and the square root of x is the square root of x. Uh, so basically another way of writing this is four over five multiplied by one over the square root of x. So then you can see that therefore t is proportional to one over the square root of x. And for t greater than zero, that's important because I guess if we're taking that square root, we could have a plus or minus in there, plus or minus uh, four and five. Uh, but because they're saying t greater than zero, we just uh, we don't have to worry about that plus or minus. So I guess that's why that's in there. Uh, but that was question uh, 14 for a total of five marks. Question 15 says a equals three to the power five times five times seven to the power three. B equals two to the power three times three times seven to the power four. And part A, part one says find the highest common factor of A and B. So when you're given numbers in their prime factor form like this, to find the highest common factor, what you want to do is to take the prime factors that are common to both. So if we look at these prime factors in A, we have three, five, and seven. In B, we have two, three, and seven. So firstly, we're not going to be worrying about that two cube because there's no twos in A. Then we look at the exponents. So we have three to the power one in B and three to the power five in A. So I have uh, one lot of three common to both numbers. Uh, so if I had a three squared here, 
then three squared would be common to both, but I only have one lot of three. So in the highest common factor, we're going to have uh, one lot of three in there. And then looking at the sevens, I have a seven cubed and a seven to the power four. So seven cubed is common to both. So that's also going to be in the highest common factor. And that five there, we don't have to worry about either. That's like the two in B, it's not in B. So we don't worry about that five. Okay, so now we have our highest common factor. And these questions here are a little bit mean because they're not saying that you can leave it in prime factor form. Now I know that this would be fine for your final answer. And also if you check the mark scheme, uh, it says this is fine for your final answer. And I think they should say that because I know uh, quite a few students would go ahead and work this out. They would be doing, uh, they would be trying to work out seven cubed or they might know seven cubed and then they'd be doing seven cubed times three to get your final answer of uh, 1029. Uh, but you don't need to do that. You don't need to work out that number. You can leave it as three times seven cubed, which I think they should say in the question. But anyways, let's move on. Part two, as you would expect, says find the lowest common multiple of A and B. So for this one, rather than looking for what's common between both, we take the highest exponent of those prime factors. So for example, this two cubed, that's the only base two number in here. So we take that two cubed as part of the lowest common multiple. Uh, we have a three to the power one versus a three to the power five. I like to think of them as battling each other. You know, which one has the highest exponent? A three to the power one or three to the power five? Well, the three to the power five is gonna win. It has the highest exponent, the most powerful exponent. So therefore that three to the power five earns its place into the lowest common multiple, if you like. I like to think of them as battling each other, but you know, whatever, maybe that's a bit silly. But anyways, now looking at the fives, is there any fives in B? No, there's not, there's only that one five. So that wins, that goes into the lowest common multiple. And then we have this seven cubed versus the seven to the power four. So which one has the higher exponent? The seven to the power four, that one wins. So that one earns its place in the lowest common multiple. So now our lowest common multiple here is going to be two cubed times three to the power five times five times seven to the power four. And now that's really cruel. If someone went ahead and tried to work that out in a non-calculated paper, that would be a huge waste of time. So again, I really do think they should state, don't have to work out the, the actual answer. You can leave it in prime factor form. But there you go, that's your final answer there for part A. Part B says A equals three to the power five times five times seven cubed. B equals two cubed times three times seven to the power four. C equals two to the power P times five to the power Q times seven to the power R. Given that the highest common factor of B and C is two cubed times seven, and the lowest common multiple of A and C is two to the power four times three to the power five times five squared times seven cubed. Part B says find the value of P, the value of Q, and the value of R. So I guess what this is asking us to do is to kind of work backwards uh, the order of what we did in part A. So if the highest common factor of B and C is two cubed times seven, looking at these numbers here, well, uh, remember the highest common factor is what's common to both. So therefore we know P is at least three. We have a two cubed in C, but P could be bigger than three um, and seven well, remember seven, uh, the highest common factor is what's common to both. So therefore we know R must be one because uh, if it was any higher than one, uh, one, we would have a larger exponent for seven here for B and C. So I know R therefore must be one. And I'm not sure how you would show any working out for this other than to kind of know the process. So I guess just writing down the answers here would be fine. Uh, and then looking at A and C, the lowest common multiple, uh, thinking about that battle between the exponents, uh, well, two to the power of four, uh, there's no base two number in A, there's no twos in A, so therefore P we know automatically must be four for this lowest common multiple. So this is going to be four here. Uh, then we're looking for the five, well, we have 
uh, 5 squared in the lowest common multiple, therefore the highest exponent here must be a 2. There's only a 5 in A, so this Q will be 2. And that is everything we need to worry about. We don't need to look at those other numbers there. So P equals 4, Q equals 2, and R equals 1. And that's question 15 for 4 marks. Question 16 says Jack plays a game with two fair spinners A and B. Spinner A can land on the numbers 2 or 3 or 5 or 7. Spinner B can land on the numbers 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6. Jack spins both spinners. He wins the game if one spinner lands on an odd number and the other spinner lands on an even number. Jack plays the game twice. Work out the probability that Jack wins the game both times. I'm going to find this easier to think about if I do uh, a little drawing of these spinners. So I'm going to draw two circles over here and sketch out what these spinners would look like. So the first one, spinner A, has two, three, five, or seven, um, and they're fair spinners. That means that each number would have an equal chance of uh, landing on it. So that would be split into quarters. And then spinner B has five numbers, two, three, four, five, or six. So that would be as uh, evenly as I can draw this. So it's not going to be perfect, but hopefully that's pretty fair. And then I have two, three, four, five, and six in there. And going back to the question again, it says he wins if one spinner lands on an odd number and the other spinner lands on an even number. So we're talking about odd or even numbers. So what I might do here is to highlight the odd and even numbers different colors. So that's even. And then in the second one, I have two, four, and six as even. And then highlight the odd numbers different colors. So this would be three, five, seven and three and five here. Okay, so you don't have to do all this work. It is, I guess, a bit time consuming, uh, but it's something you can do if you're getting stuck, right? If you don't know where to start, draw some diagrams that can help you work through that or where you're getting stuck. So now we're looking for, uh, if you're landing on an odd number and an even number. So we're looking for the probability of odd and even. That could be one possibility of winning. Or what else could you get? Well, you could get the first spinner to be even and the second one to be odd. Now you might think they're the same thing, but actually we've got two spinners. So we're thinking of this one being odd and this one being even, or this one being even and this one being odd. So I should say A and B there. So A being odd, this one being even, or vice versa. Now he plays the game twice. It's going to be the same. The numbers don't change, the spinners don't change, so the probability is going to be the same for the second game as well. All we'd have to do there is to multiply this by itself because remember when we have the probability of A and the probability of B, this is the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. We're saying he wins both games, so it's the probability of winning and the probability of winning. So what we're doing is we're working out this probability and then we're squaring it, okay? So what I'm going to do is to say, well, the probability of odd and an even, odd on spinner A would be three out of four, and then even on B, that would be three out of five. And we multiply those because we're saying and, they both happen. Or add even and odd. Even is one out of four for spinner A. Multiplied by odd for spinner B is two out of five. And then I'm going to square this. So let's work this out first. So three times three is nine. Four times five is 20. Plus one times two is two. Four times five is 20. All squared. Nine plus two is 11 over 20, all squared. 11 squared is 121, 20 squared is 400. So therefore our final answer there should be 121 out of 400. What is that? That's approximately one quarter. So we're saying he has about a one quarter chance of 
winning both games. Now, it's kind of difficult to think about that intuitively. Let's have a go, though. So if he wants to get odd and even and he wants to win both games, well, let's look at this one, 11 over 20, bit more than half. So that was the chance of winning uh, one game. Um, so he needed an odd and the other to be even. Basically, he's saying if this one lands on even, this one needs to land on an odd. And I guess the point is because spinner A has three odd numbers, you're more likely to get an odd number here. And because spinner B has three even numbers, you're more likely to get an even number on spinner B. So the chances are that you do get an odd and an even number. I guess that's the point. Therefore, you've got more than 50% chance of winning. And then, because he plays twice, the probability is always going to go down if you want to win two games in a row. So it goes from 50% to just a bit more than 25%. So, okay. You don't always have to try to think about these things intuitively, but sometimes if you do have the time to try to wrap your head around it, 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 you know, it can be fun to think about these things in that way. All right, anyway, sorry for rambling a bit. That, that was question 16 for four marks. Question 17 says express one over nine X squared, take 25, subtract one over six X plus 10 as a single fraction in its simplest form. When you have these algebraic fractions, you want to uh, combine them, find the common denominator and uh, then simplify. So now there's a bit of a trick to this one and that's the reason it's only three marks. If you go through the whole process of multiplying everything, it's a bit more lengthy. Um, so I'll show you the little trick here. Firstly, you want to write this first fraction. Uh, you want to notice this is the difference of two squares. So uh, 9x squared take 25 can be written as 3x all squared take 5 squared. And you should know what the difference of two squares is. You have two square numbers subtracted and then you can write this as 3x uh, plus 5 uh, multiplied by 3x take 5. If you expand that out, you end up with 3x squared take 5 squared. So that first fraction you can write as 3x uh, plus 5 multiplied by 3x take 5. This second fraction here, you can factorize this 6x plus 10. The common factor there is 2, so you could write this as 2 times 3x plus 5. And what you notice now is that all you need to multiply this one by is 3x take 5 and multiply this fraction by two, and then you'll have your common factor, which will be two times three x plus five, three x take five. So in my first fraction here, I'm multiplying this one by two. So this would be two all over the denominator. Subtract the second fraction I want to multiply by three x take five. So one times three x take five, and put brackets around that so you know to expand that negative to both terms. And then as I was saying, the denominator becomes two times three X plus five, three X take five. And by using that little trick, by noticing that uh, you avoid quite a bit of uh, expanding and simplifying with these fractions. So once we get to this point, all we really need to do is to simplify the numerator. So expand those brackets with that negative. This becomes two take three X plus five all over the denominator. And then again, simplify it. So two plus five is seven. Seven take three X all over the denominator again. And that's actually fine for your final answer. You don't need to expand out those double brackets. When it says uh, simplest form, there's actually no difference between expanding brackets and leaving them as factorized, unless you're going to end up canceling something. That's not going to happen here. So either expanding those brackets or leaving them like that is fine. And I would suggest leaving them like that because you're saving yourself work. So final answer there, seven take three X all over two uh, multiplied by those brackets. Okay, and that was question 17 for three marks. Question 18 part A says, show that the square root of 45 plus root 20 equals five root five. Show you're working clearly. 
This is simplifying CERDs, so you need to understand how to break CERDs into uh, smaller factors. For example, the square root of 45 can be written as uh, the square root of 9 times the square root of 5, because 9 times 5 is 45. The square root of 20 can be written as uh, the square root of 4 times the square root of 5. If you simplify these, this would be 3 times 5, uh, root 5, sorry, and the square root of 4 is 2, so this could be written as 2 root 5. Therefore, this expression up here, or this equation up here, can be written as uh, 3 root 5 plus 2 root 5, and this equals 5 root 5. So uh, you don't have to write it like this. Probably better to uh, write it as an equation and work it out that way, but as long as you're understanding how to split up SIRDs into their simplest form, you'll be fine for that question. I did a lot of SIRDs in my 99 problems video, so check that out if you want uh, practice on SIRDs. Part B says express 2 over root 3 take 1 in the form P plus root Q, where P and Q are integers, show you're working clearly. For this, we're going to be rationalizing the denominator and we use the conjugate for this, so you can multiply this by root 3 plus 1 over root 3 plus 1. That is what we call a conjugate, and what this is going to do is to eliminate that third from the denominator, uh, which is called rationalizing the denominator. So uh, you can think of these as double brackets on the bottom line and uh, brackets on the top line, so 2 times root 3 is 2 root 3 plus 2 times 1. That's going to be the numerator. The denominator, expand them out as you would normally with double brackets. Root 3 times root 3 is 3. Plus 1 times root 3 is plus root 3. Negative 1 times root 3 is negative root 3. And negative 1 times positive 1 is negative 1. Then we have 2 root 3 plus 2 all over. Uh, root 3 take root 3. They are going to cancel out. Those terms there, that's the point. We get rid of that third on the bottom line. And then 3 take 1 is going to be 2. And then we can divide that numerator by 2. And we would end up with, well, 2 root 3 divided by 2 is just root 3. 2 divided by 2 is 1. So we end up with root 3 plus 1 for a final answer there. On to the last question, question 19. Question 19 says ABC is an isosceles triangle such that AB equals AC. A has coordinates 4, 37. B and C lie on the line with equation 3Y equals 2X plus 12. Find an equation of the line of symmetry of triangle ABC. Give your answer in the form PX plus QY equals R where P, Q and R are integers. Show clear algebraic working. Hopefully your brain is shouting out for a diagram here as mine was. So firstly, let's draw a diagram. Uh, a, B, C is an isosceles triangle. So firstly, let's draw triangle A, B, C. And because A, B equals A, C, well, this is going to be A at the top and B and C on the bottom. And these are the equal lengths. A has coordinates 4, 37. Okay, so this is 4, 37 up here. And B and C lie on the line with equation 3y equals 2x plus 12. All right, so there's a line going through B and C and I guess it would extend out, and that's 3y equals 2x plus 12, okay? Find an equation of the line of symmetry of triangle ABC. Well, I guess the easiest line of symmetry to think about would be the one straight down the middle of this isosceles triangle, and because it's a line of symmetry, it means it bisects this base length. Also, it's perpendicular to the base, so this line, uh, let's call this point M, A, M would be perpendicular to B, C. So that line of symmetry is bisecting B, C, also it's perpendicular to B, C. That's useful to know it's perpendicular because we know that lines perpendicular to each other have uh, gradients that are negative reciprocals of each other. Now we have the gradient of the line B, C. They give us this equation of this line. Therefore, we're going to be able to find the gradient of AM. Uh, and that's going to be my starting point here. So firstly, I would rearrange this equation. So we can say y equals 2 over 3x plus 4. That's essentially the equation of BC. 
So then I can say, therefore, the gradient of AM, of line AM, is the negative reciprocal of 2 over 3. That's negative 3 over 2. And now we can say the equation of the line of symmetry, or line AM, is going to look like uh, y equals negative 3 on 2x plus c. And for this question, you need to know about the line, the equation of a straight line, which is y equals mx plus c. m is the gradient, c is the y-intercept. You need to understand that formula. You need to understand what each part of it means, and you need to understand how to find c when you have m and a point on that line. Uh, this is a really uh, key thing you need to understand for GCSEs. It comes up all the time, and I'm actually going to write this down because it seems to be something that people struggle to get their head around, but it's really important. So I'll write this down. How to find C when you have M and a point on the line. Absolutely essential you understand how to do this. So let's go ahead and do this for uh, the equation of AM. We have Y equals MX plus C. We don't have C. So now we use this point 437. So we say uh, using A, which is 437, substitute these into this equation. This is the Y value. So 37 is substituted for Y. Uh, then we have the gradient multiplied by X. X is 4. That's the X coordinate. So we can substitute it in for X. And we can go ahead and solve this for C. So, uh, well, firstly, 4 divided by 2 is 2. Multiplied by negative 3 is negative 6. Add that to the other side. 37 plus 6, that would be 43. So there we go, we solve for C. So therefore, uh, Y equals negative 3 on 2X plus 43. We have the equation of that line. Remember, this question is asking uh, the answer in the form PX plus QY equals R. So we're going to have to rearrange this slightly. Firstly, I guess I would multiply everything by 2 to get rid of this fraction because there are no, uh, there's no fraction in here. Um, so multiply everything by 2, we'd have 2y equal to negative 3x plus 86. And then bring that x term over to the left-hand side. Then we would have 3x plus 2y equals 86. And... Just another double check, px plus qy equals r. Yes, so we have it in that form now. My final answer would be 3x plus 2y equals 86. And that was question 19 for five marks. Not too many uh, really difficult steps. Again, that was the key part of that question there. All right, so that was the end of that paper. I hope you found that useful. Please leave a like if you did. Subscribe if you want to see more content. I'll leave a link to the playlist if you want to see papers two and three. And I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.